forward to getting you. On 100.9 WXIR, this is Evidence of Design. And I'm your host, Jason Taylor. Good morning, everyone. You are listening to 100.9 FM WXIR. This is Evidence of Design, and I am your host, Jason Taylor, and I am joined today by my good friend and co-host, Matt Treadwell. Yo. It is our 16th show of Evidence of Design, and we are excited to be here and happy to spend this time with you and with WXIR. Folks, for those who are new to our show, we talk about the political economy every week, and the political economy is simply how do our politics and values affect our economics and money and the things that we have to live our life in the modern capitalist society. So basically, how do our politics and values affect our economics and outcomes? We talk about that every week, and we also attempt to critique this thing called neoliberalism, which is basically the way our society is constructed, at least Matt and I believe and argue, that our society is perhaps too far constructed on money and free markets as opposed to valuing community, groups of people, and social welfare. Instead of profits, Matt and I think we should value people. So we like to pick every week a different topic to focus on uh, that really elucidates or really shows we think uh, the, sort of the problem in our economy. And this week, Matt and I are focusing on another Supreme Court case. If you tuned in last week, we talked about Janus versus AFSCME. That was a Supreme Court case that covered union rights. And two weeks prior to that, I think three weeks actually, we covered Lewis versus Epic Systems Corporation. That covered workers' ability to collectively sue their employers. This week, we are talking about Ohio versus American Express. That was a Supreme Court decision that came out a few weeks ago, and that covers credit cards and interchange fees. What the heck does all that mean? Well, we'll get into it. It's actually super interesting, and it does affect you. We'll also talk a little bit today about some other things that were happening in, in the news and this thing called the Brexit short, of which reporting was done on. We would love to have you participate in the show. You can email us, evidenceofdesign101 at gmail.com. And we have launched into the Twitter stratosphere, just like last week. It was our first time with Twitter. You can tweet us, evidence design zero at evidence design zero. And also, folks, participate directly. Give us a call, 585-219-8889. Matt, let's take it away. It's a good thing that we're on radio so no one can see us dancing in our chairs. Um, you didn't have to tell them. <laughs> Matt, who was that? That was Funkadelic with their song, Can You Get To That, from the 1972 funk rock masterpiece, Maggot Brain. Awesome. I've never heard of Funkadelic, but I definitely like some funk. I used to help out with uh, some jazz music in the Rochester community, and I really got to appreciate uh, the rich history of jazz, but also sort of jazz funk. and. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that fits into the larger musical sort of uh, stream there, but I definitely dug that. So, folks, 
We are going to kick off the show by talking about some things that happened in the news this week. There was quite a bit happening, and I actually didn't spend as much time following the news this week as I usually do. I was I was kind of working on some other things, but I'm excited to cover at least a few of the major headlines. And Matt, I think one of them has to do with Scott Pruitt. That's right, Jason. What is Who is Scott Pruitt and what happened? Scott Pruitt, up until a few weeks ago, was the head of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, he's, been a ve- he's been very controversial, even among uh, Trump's cabinet picks, uh, because he's been embroiled in a number of uh, scandals, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to read a quote from NPR just to catch everybody up. Uh, Pruitt was among... The most controversial of Trump's original cabinet level picks, he embodied the administration's broad support for the fossil fuel industry and its disdain for climate science. Since then, he has attracted the the attention of Congress and the EPA's inspector general for a wide range of of potential ethics violations that hinged on misusing his power and spending far more taxpayer money than his predecessors had on travel and security expenses. Pruitt came to the EPA from Oklahoma, where he spent years as the state attorney's general attacking the federal agency he would eventually run. With other Republican attorneys general, he sued the EPA to stop ozone and methane emissions rules and block regulations on coal-fired power plants. Throughout his career, he has publicly questioned climate change and whether it is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So, an interesting choice, (laughs) to say the least, to lead a department known as the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Trump has already announced his pick for replacement for Scott Pruitt. That would be Deputy Administrator Andrew Wheeler, who is a former coal lobbyist and senior staff, senior Senate staffer. So it's hard to celebrate the news of Scott Pruitt resigning because the, per, the person who still decides who, who runs the EPA has views about climate change and environmental protection that are pretty much in line with what Scott Pruitt was already doing. And this isn't the first Trump appointee, of course, who uh, had didn't like the agency that they were appointed to run. There's a number of other... Individuals such as Mick Mulvaney, Mick Mulvaney, <laughs> Mick Mulvaney and uh, uh, Tom Price, Tom Price, yeah, former I think uh, health secretary. We we got to make that chart of all the different departments and people who run them. <laughs> I'll get but, out my red tape. Yeah, get out the red tape. But w- what's interesting to me is how long Scott Pruitt lasted in his role with a litany of wide ranging ethics violations. And arguably, Scott Pruitt lasted so long is because he was doing his job well in terms of deregulating the environmental agency and Trump and uh, a large section of his base, particularly those in coal country were real happy with that. And so yeah. it, I think that you could push aside for these voters, Scott Pruitt's is pretty blatant and shocking ethic violations in favor of the things that they found as favorable policy. It has been said that the only reason or well, not the only reason, but, but a, a, a major reason in why Scott Pruitt is resigning is because he's simply too unpopular at this point, and Republicans are worried about how he might affect their chances going into the midterm elections this year. Yeah, I always say politics is about making the politically impossible become the politically inevitable. And, of course, if you were someone who found even one of Scott Pruitt's ethic violations to be untenable, well, add on 12 more, and all of a sudden a few other folks might agree with you that it's politically inevitable that Scott Pruitt has to leave. But it's unfortunate that sometimes we all have our different lines and have different uh, different sort of values for for when things go too far. But yep, Scott Pruitt is out, and EPA will continue to run, and largely, I think, as you said, Matt, in a deregulatory and perhaps arguably unfriendly climate agenda. Yeah. Something else that happened this week, though, is, of course, we're talking about a number of Supreme Court cases, and why Matt and I have been focusing so much on the Supreme Court, for those who might have missed last week, is that the Supreme Court has a calendar year, meaning most of the cases they decide, most of the decisions the Supreme Court makes, usually ends up happening at the end of June. That's when the Supreme Court kind of rules their decisions. So we're focusing so much on the Supreme Court because it just so happens that all of their decisions have come out. Like that other great American pastime. Baseball. I was going to say the NFL, but sure. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea when those are in season there. But uh, the Supreme Court has released a number of decisions. The calendar year is over, and I think they'll start again in October. And that is important because, of, as we've mentioned, as you probably know, Justice Anthony Kennedy has announced his retirement, and he was, as 
I'd say the mainstream media has been saying that Anthony Kennedy is the famous swing voter, but of course he largely voted conservative. It just so happened that he favored some socially progressive policy, such as uh, gay rights and, um, oh boy, is there anything else? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think he did support Roe v. Wade. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So he upheld a certain uh, cases that were supportive of Roe v. Wade. Which, absolutely. to his credit, I mean... I would much rather have him on the court than uh, Brett Kavanaugh. And Brett Kavanaugh is the individual who Trump has announced to replace Justice Anthony Kennedy. Kavanaugh has a long history in Washington and in politics, and he most recently he served on the U.S. Court of Appeals. That's sort of the second highest level of courts in the federal system in the U.S., and that's where most of the uh, Supreme Court justices come from, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. So Kavanaugh also served in George W. Bush's administration, George right. Bush number two, and he served in the White House as staff secretary. He's also from law school and um, where most, where a lot of other Supreme Court justices are from. Interestingly, <laughs> he also served with Kenneth kind of Starr, the independent counsel who was investigating President Bill Clinton as special counsel during his administration. That's right. So <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh has a long history in politics and... He is perhaps going to be appointed as Supreme Court, uh, the next Supreme Court justice. Seems likely. It seems likely because um, McCain, John McCain, that's just, <laughs> Mitch McCain. <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> <laughs> I always mess up Mitch McConnell and anyone else. There are a lot of M names <laughs> in the Senate. And just Mitch McConnell's face is just plastered in, in, in my memory for some reason. Into your gray matter. <laughs> But Mitch McConnell figures into this because if we remember back to 2016, when Anthony Scalia passed away, uh, constitutionally Obama had the right to appoint Merrick Garland and Democrats, and I, I would I would say I, I'm smarted over this, and that's the reason why Trump is able to support so far two justices to the Supreme Court, and it looks like Brett Kavanaugh will be appointed. And there is real worry for folks who support Roe versus Wade and other fairly progressive policies that those things may be overturned under the largely conservative Supreme Court. Yeah. I don't know how true this is, although there is like, um, there is some speculation that there might be some difficulty in getting Brett Kavanaugh confirmed because there is at least one Republican senator. I can't remember her name right now. Mm -hmm. or Murkowski. The it's Probably, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. She has publicly stated that she will not support a Supreme Court justice who intends to reverse Roe v. Wade. Um, John McCain, I think, is also unable to vote because he's seeking treatment for his cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be, but I mean, even if even if he doesn't get confirmed, I mean, Trump will probably just appoint somebody else. And you know, I mean, that's like it's the same situation as like the, the Scott Pruitt thing, where the person who's calling the shots is is not working in the interest of the people. Right. Yeah. So something else that happened this week is that the justice department indicted 12 Russian intelligence officers who have been indicted for playing a role in the hacking of the democratic national committee back during way back folks during the 2016 presidential election, two whole years ago. It's a bad nightmare that keeps resurfacing and will for a long time. I believe 2016 that and Mitch McConnell's face. <laughs> That's right. Well, that has been going on for a long time. <laughs> Sorry, Mitch McConnell. Um, the, the, so this, this is, this is significant because of course the conservatives have been trying the conservative media. I should say, I, again, I, I, I should be very specific with my language. The conservative media, establishment, the one that is trying very hard to uh, sort of undermine special counsel Robert Mueller, they've been trying very hard to discredit the integrity of the FBI and the intelligence system in order to make the case that somehow our intelligence system was biased against Donald Trump and right. trying to say that there is no collusion, it's witch hunt, it's the biggest waste of taxpayer money ever, and, and just trying to discredit the integrity of these uh, really important American institutions and the Justice Department. So this is this is significant, the indicting of the Russian intelligence officers, because it's coming from the Justice Department itself, part of the executive branch, the branch that's under control by Donald Trump. And you know there there have been some tweets and comments made from at least uh, Rudy Giuliani saying, "Great, you know the, these indictments of these Russian intelligence officers, who are now we collectively agree, and it's been proven that they have undermined." the Democratic National Committee in favor of Donald Trump. So 
the Russians hacked emails and they were slanderous and they released them in order to make voters uh, not vote for Hillary Clinton and vote for Donald Trump to get them elected. This is important because, well, it, let me go back to what um, Rudy Giuliani said. He was like, yeah, you know, this reconfirms because they're only indicting Russians that there is no collusion and Trump is completely innocent and that we should end this investigation. So trying to sweep it under the rug and Robert Mueller, unless something real dramatic happens, will be here for quite some time investigating 2016. Yeah. We should also mention that um, there's likely to not be any, even a trial mm-hmm. because uh, in order for that to happen, Russia would have to extradite its intelligence officers to America. And I don't see why they would do that. Well, Trump is meeting with Putin on Monday. That's a big deal. Trump is having his first sort of bilateral, unilateral meeting just with President Vladimir Putin on Monday. And I'm sure, Matt, that our leader will advocate for that to happen. We have a lot of confidence in him, Jason. Sarcasm. Like share yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll definitely see what happens. But, folks, we have one more week in the news to talk about with you, and this one is really quite special. I'm really excited. Matt, what is going on with P- Paul Ryan? Oh, uh, well, you know, uh, I, w- I thought it would be fun to include some good news this week. So uh, yeah. I'm just going to read something from NPR, which is um, House Speaker Paul Ryan explained Thursday that a, a family of woodchucks moved into his Chevy Suburban recently, and they ate the wiring, rendering the car useless. Uh, my car was eaten by animals, Paul Ryan said, to laughs from an audience at an event hosted by the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. It's just dead, he said. Uh, the car was parked at his mother's house in his hometown in Wisconsin, and when she came back from her annual trip to Florida for the winter, it wouldn't start. As a top congressional leader, Ryan has a security detail, and he hasn't been allowed to drive in three years. So I towed it to the dealer. They put it up, and they realized that a family of woodchucks lived in the underbody of my suburban, Ryan said. And I just think that's a that's a, a nice, happy little note to, to end on, end the week on. It was a wild pack of woodchucks who came along and ate up Paul Ryan's Chevy Suburban. I'm not sure if that is sort of a significant, like, is that, a, is that ominous? Is that f- prophecy? Is, is that prophecy? <laughs> it's prophetic? I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, is that foreshadowing? Is that foreshadowing for what's to come? Of course, Paul Ryan is the lame duck Senate, or sorry, House of Representatives majority leader for the Republicans who has announced his retirement at the, by the end of this year. So he will be leaving the House of Reps and he was, of course, the vice president, vice presidential nominee on the, uh, not McCain, the Romney ticket in right. 2012. Folks, that was a week in the news. You are listening to Evidence of Design here, 100.9 FM WXIR. Give us an email, evidenceofdesign101 at gmail.com, or tweet us, Evidence Design Zero. Also, give us a call, 585-219-8889. Let's now talk about the meat of today's show, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, just a few weeks ago, released their sort of opinion on the Ohio versus American Express case. If you use credit cards, this case affects you. If you don't use credit cards because everyone else uses credit cards, this case affects you. So we are going to try to break down what this case is all about and talk a little bit about these things called interchange fees. Matt, let's hear Chief Justice John Roberts introducing the case. We'll hear argument in case 16-1454, Ohio et al. versus American Express Company. So what is the Sparknotes version of this case, Matt? What was going on in Ohio versus American Express? Well, before we dive into that, Jason, I think it's important that we establish a working definition of interchange fees. Please do, because I am confused about them as well. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Actually, I was wondering if you could tell me what you know about interchange fees. Well, I... What I do know is that when you go to a store and you pay with a credit card, let's say, I don't know if this works with debit cards or just normal bank cards. Mm -hmm. Um, If you go to a store with a credit card, so Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, if you use any one of those cards, you don't see it as the consumer or as the customer, but the merchants, the store that you're buying the good from, the store has to pay the credit card company a certain percentage of your transaction as a fee for the store using credit card companies' as services. So what that means is if I buy a $5 thing, I'm paying $5 to the store, 
the store only gets, let's say, $4.85 of my $5, and the other $0.15 cents goes to the credit card companies. That That's my understanding of interchange fees. That's pretty good. Uh, one thing I think we'll all realize diving into this is that this seems almost purposefully designed to be confusing and difficult to understand, but that was a pretty good reading of it. So you are correct in saying that interchange fees are on credit cards. They are also on debit cards hmm. and even prepaid cards, hmm. uh, which I, in my research I came across is actually the fastest growing payment method in America. One in 10 Americans use a prepaid card these days. Wow. Well, yeah, I wonder why. Um, so yeah, so interchange fees. Uh, ba- basically, what you said is true. It's if we want to dive into the more nuanced bit of it, it's basically um, it is a fee that the credit card company takes for for processing its information. So the the service that they're providing basically has a fee. Um, the money is um, it's not taken out of the the merchants. It's not like the merchant gets the $5 and then they pay the mm-hmm. credit card company. It's automatically deducted before the merchant even acquires the money. So it's not necessarily like they're paying them. I mean, not technically, but it's the end result is the same, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the rates of interchange fees vary. They can vary for a multitude of reasons for, uh, from where you live, but the the primary deciding factor is typically the brand of card you choose to use. Now... Um, Back in 2010, with the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was a, uh, a piece of legislation written into law to sort of address the 2008 financial crisis. It was a right. n- number of huge sweeping changes. It established the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau. Yeah, that Mick Mulvaney is <laughs> trying, trying to, to get destroy. Destroyed, just like Scott Pruitt was trying to destroy, destroy the, the EPA. EPA and, yep. All that. Um, excuse me. Yes. So, uh, you know, after 2008, the financial crisis, Matt, you're, you're hitting on a number of systemic issues going on uh, in the economy. And the whole point of Dodd-Frank was to try to fix some of those systemic issues. And one of those, I think you'll you'll let listeners know, because I don't know much about this more than what I'm saying here, is that one of those was trying to regulate credit card companies in, to some degree. Actually, debit card companies. Debit um, cards. The Durbin Amendment, hmm. which required the Federal Reserve to lower fees on debit cards, um, Interchange fees, as I understand it, uh, for debit, debit cards are fixed at 21 cents plus 0.05 percent of the transaction. Um, before that, uh, in my research, it would seem to be the case that debit cards typically range between one and three percent, mm. which is roughly where a lot of credit cards are. So they were comparable, basically. Right. And um, excluding like uh, like very uh, cheap purchases, this is a a major reduction in uh, the interchange on debit card, the interchange rates on debit cards. Mm-hmm. And and th- let's just say also that like, so businesses like the use of credit cards and debit cards to some extent because it allows us as customers to have very fast transactions. You don't really hear much about layaway anymore. You know, I, I remember growing up and going to Kmart and people were in line to like, get layaway on a couch or something. That was right. To my knowledge, like a credit card before credit cards in a way. The only layaway, uh, the only businesses rather that I know that still offer layaway personally are um, music stores Mm. on expensive equipment. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine, yeah, I'm sure there's other stores that are, maybe like Walmart or something, but yeah. It does seem to be something that is dying out. Right. And that's the ubiquity of credit cards, which of course sort of, uh, to my knowledge, really gained popularity in the 1970s and increased, uh, you know, increased uh, sort of access to credit and all, and all the other things. But th- so back to my original point of like why all this is significant and uh, merchants typically like the use of credit cards and debit cards because it allows us as customers to pay really easily. The businesses don't have to like fuddle around with cash and bring it to banks and risk it, them being robbed or having it stolen. Right. And uh, credit cards and debit cards, of course, like us using their services because we pay for the services, whether through monthly interest rates or just on top fees of using the cards. Yep. And as customers, we typically like those cards because for the same reasons the merchants, they're really easy to use. But also we get rewards, especially in terms of credit cards. But even debit cards now give you rewards uh, or incentives for using them. So as customers, we get incentives for using the cards by like, you know, build up points and get cash back or have a free hotel stay or whatever. That's right. So we'll, we'll be talking about that. Definitely. Um, I guess w- one thing we can bring up that... Um, I should say that my understanding of this isn't isn't 
You're an expert. Thorough? I, I know all about it. <laughs> um, but there was a, a study that was recently published, I believe this year, by a Harvard University PhD candidate, and um, they found that the the Durban Amendment was it appeared to be unsuccessful in lowering at least merchant fees, and it also had perhaps the unattended effect of uh, raising, uh, uh, excuse me, of, um, of having banks' revenues fall mm-hmm. because of a. The availability of free checking for bank customers has decreased, apparently. I don't know what any of that means, necessarily, um, but I think one of the reasons why Durban might not have been as effective as perhaps it may have been desired or intended to be is because, I, as far as I can tell, none, nothing in Dodd-Frank addressed credit card mm-hmm. interchange fees, Sure. which seems to be a major aspect of the market. So, so everything I hear you saying so far is, you know, we're talking about the Supreme Court case, Ohio versus American Express. And what I hear you saying so far is, look, there's been other legislation that came before that. One of those was the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act that was a response to the 2008 global financial crisis. Yes. And one of the things the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act did was try to regulate at least the interchange fees on debit cards. And yes. there is some concern that that was ineffective. And my guess would be that it's because Dodd-Frank and the Durban Amendment did not address credit card interchange fees. Got it. And wh- what was the significance of regulating these debit card interchange fees? Like, why regulate it? How does the Dodd-Frank Act regulating debit card interchange fees protect consumers? Because that must have been the, the purpose of them, perhaps. Right. Well, I mean, one of the concerns with these um, interchange fees is that... Uh, um, well, I guess we should just jump into the case if we want yeah, to Yeah, let's about do that. it. I mean, yeah, help me understand because, I mean, what, what's the incentive for protecting consumers by regulating interchange fees? So for a number of years, credit cards have u- credit card companies, I should say, have written to their merchant contracts. That's the contracts that merchants uh, sign on to in order to be able to process their credit cards. Mm-hmm. Things called anti-steering provisions. Um, this is what Amex was going to, to court over. Okay. Now, anti-steering provisions are called that because they prevent merchants from steering customers to an alternate payment method. Um, so merchants, of yeah. course, have a, a vested interest in getting their customers to use payment methods that get them more money. So, like, let's say, um, well, I guess, I guess I should say, historically, American Express, American Express has higher interchange fees than most of the other credit card companies. Um, for comparison... Visa and MasterCard typically hover between two and three percent. American Express is a bit higher at three to five percent for um, of the total transaction. Hmm. So if you're a merchant, you obviously would pr- prefer if people paid with Visa or MasterCard as opposed to American Express because you're getting more money. Mm-hmm. In order to combat that, uh, American Express and and Visa and MasterCard at one point had anti-steering provisions in their contracts saying you can't tell your customers how to pay, you can't charge them different prices based on interchange fees. So let's say uh, I lose, I'm a merchant, and I lose 15 more cents for this purchase because my customer is paying with a uh, American Express card. I can't charge them 15 cents more to cover that loss. That's just everybody pays the exact same price no matter what card they use, no matter what payment option they use. Mm -hmm. And that's what anti-steering provisions are. And I... I think I've seen some stores, Matt, where you walk in and there's like a, a little placard in front of the cash register that says, you know, we do not accept American Express. That's different than what you're talking about because that means the merchant did not sign a transaction agreement with American Express. Right. Uh, and that is a strategy that a lot of uh, businesses choose to take. And I think as we go into this, I hope that it will be become clear why that is no longer a viable uh, solution to this problem for a lot of a lot of businesses. To not accept American Express or to right. steer? To not accept, to simply Ameri- not accept American Express cards. Right. So basically, the anti-steering provision says, hey, if you you cannot force or you cannot uh, imply or coerce or try to uh, encourage customers to use a different credit card. Right. You can't encourage different payment options based on interchange fees. Got it. And um. And like you, I think you said this earlier, Jason, uh, interchange fees are largely invisible to consumers. I mean, entirely, I believe. Um, 
In fact, I've been doing a little walking around this week and asking people that I run into at, at, at the stores typically, asking them if interchange fees ever came up in their training or if they know what they are, and most people don't. Yeah. Most people don't seem to need to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least their their companies choose not to tell them about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I think that's something to be uh, to to keep in mind, if mm-hmm. to not be concerned about. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. So, so here we have the Supreme Court case. It, it, it was brought up, and that the state of Ohio and other organizations challenged American Express for these anti-steering provisions. Is that correct, Matt? That's what the case is about. Uh, the, the organization said, look, American Express, you cannot have these anti-steering provisions because they adversely affect consumers. And ultimately, their argument was it is a violation of antitrust law. Right. I I think I, I haven't mentioned yet, but I should say that the end result of all these anti-steering provisions is that because merchants can't tell their customers about mm. um, different payment options... The the anti-competitive aspect of this case is that it's very difficult for other payment options to gain any traction and get off the ground, and ultimately what ends up what ends up happening is that merchants just end up raising their prices and consumers pay more mm-hmm. for the same. Right. So that's the crux of the matter. Where like why this affects all of us, right? right? For everyone listening right now, for me, for you, for everyone, the idea is that if credit card companies are increase their interchange rates, meaning they try to get more money off of every transaction, businesses must compensate for that then somehow. And the only way businesses can compensate for that is to either A, not sign agreements with credit card companies to say, we won't accept your cards. And, you know, Matt, I know you said you might get to this later, but that's a fairly obviously bad option because all of us use some forms of payment. And if we go to a store to buy something and we don't have cash on us and they don't accept our card, well, I don't have checks. You know, I don't walk around with a checkbook anymore, so we're not going to buy anything. So that's bad for the merchant. So option number two, then, is to have merchants, have stores, raise their prices. So if credit card companies raise their interchange fees, if businesses raise their prices to compensate for those fees, we, as the consumer, then end up paying more for goods and services. And that's the crux of the issue. At least that's one argument, of course. Correct. Correct. Um, and now before we before we jump into uh, Ohio versus Amex, I should say that this court has or this case rather has its beginnings back in 2010. So mm-hmm. um, Amex has been getting a lot of the heat re- recently for these uh, anti steering provisions, but Visa and Mastercard actually had their own anti steering provisions prior to 2010 mm-hmm. when the Department of Justice um, charged basically Visa, Mastercard, and American Express with this. With what we're talking about today. And um, Visa and MasterCard chose to settle out of court. They removed the anti-steering provisions from their contracts. Amex said, no, we're going to take you to court. And um, it was a very lengthy process, five years, Hmm. I believe. Um, The Department of Justice basically argued that Amex's anti-steering provisions violated the rule of reason under the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Mm -hmm. Now... um, from my uh, own under my own uh, memories of high school <laughs> history class, <laughs> as I recall, uh, U.S. antitrust law and anti-monopoly law didn't really become super robust until FDR, I believe. Hmm. Can you confirm or deny that, Jason? Uh, I, I, it's a tough statement to like nominally say, you know, yeah. comparatively say like whether they were stronger or not. But uh, you know, go on, and I, I can add a little bit more about the Sherman Antitrust Act in a sure. second. Well, let's talk about what the rule of reason is. Um, That's basically a legal approach by competition authorities or the courts where an attempt is made to evaluate the pro-competitive features of a restrictive business practice against its anti-competitive effects in order to decide whether or not the practice should be prohibited. So basically, when you have a, uh, in antitrust law, when you have a corporation or company that seems to control a large swath of the market, Mm -hmm. um, one of the things... If they start to introduce practices that seem restrictive, the uh, the the legislative or sorry not the legislative the, the judiciary practice is to determine whether or not those practices have any uh, competitive merit, and if they don't, then ideally what happens is that they are illegal or they, they become outlawed. Mm-hmm. Got it. So that were that was the grounds on which they were trying to sue American Express. Is that is that the basis of their their case against them. Yes. Right. And of course, Matt, I believe that uh, the Supreme Court ended up deciding in a five-four 
the conservative majority said that didn't cut it. You uh, you spoiled the big repeal. <laughs> well, I, I think that it's all right. When I, <laughs> the five four majority said, "Yeah, well, this isn't going to cut it, right?" And why did they say that? Why did the conservative majority say that the Ohio at all they didn't really have grounds to win this case? Well, they basically upheld the ruling of. So I should say the. Um, I did say that the Department of Justice successfully argued this case three years ago in the District Court of the Eastern District of New York. Amex uh, appealed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and they ruled, and this is this is probably the most important piece of information to take away from all this, I believe. Um, uh, they ruled that since American Express serves both merchants and cardholders, plaintiffs alleging anti-competitive harm to merchants must also show that cardholders were worse off overall. They concluded that while the government showed that merchants had been hurt, they failed to prove net harm to cardholders. That's mm. from Vox. Vox with a V, not, not <laughs> Vox. Vox. <laughs> um, so this is uh, unprecedented in a sense. Um, as one as one writer, Lena M. Khan, wrote, um, antitrust laws have never permitted monopolistic firms to wield their market power against one set of customers so long as they benefit another set of players. Yet this kind of balancing is exactly what the Second Circuit ratified. So I'm not an expert on antitrust law by any means. Not yet. Not yet. I'm working there. <laughs> getting, getting my law PhD. School. <laughs> but yeah. um, as I understand it, this is this is unprecedented. This is new. This is uh, unlike anything that has ever happened before in in, in the realm of antitrust law. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, what all this means is that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said, "Look, credit card companies they serve two different markets: merchants who use their cards to process fees." And then card issue, card holders who use their uh, cards to pay those fees. And just because merchants are adversely affected by these interchange fees doesn't mean that card holders are. And this is something. This is a where we get to a point where I have to confess something, and that I don't necessarily understand mm-hmm. the uh, the the reasoning behind this because I feel like if the if the Department of Justice proved that um, merchants were adversely affected by their by these interchange rates, and as a result, they had to raise their fees and place that burden on consumers. Wouldn't that mean that consumers were adversely affected too by these interchange rates? Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess to be fair, when you're arguing from a purely anti-competitive standpoint, it becomes harder to see where card holders fit into all this. But I feel like that's just a really narrow and pedantic viewpoint to take i i really appreciate that because it's important to say like look when something is in front of the supreme court the supreme court must decide the case upon the rule of law it is not the supreme court's job to interpret their values on like whether or not this is helping this group of people or hurting others for the most sense right i mean they can interpret that they can interpret those value those uh value things through the rule of law so I, I agree with you, Matt, and I think we see a reoccurring theme here when in our previous episodes that you can find in our YouTube channel, uh, Evidence of Design, in our previous episodes when we talked about Janus versus AFSCME or Lewis versus Epic Systems Corporations, the arguments that the conservative majority were making were pedantic, as you said. It was very sort of wordy and technical and specific. And I don't know enough about law because law is really complicated yeah. and it's hidden behind lots of barriers, which you know maybe that's what's required for our civil society to function. Um, but I just don't know enough about law to view those as like legitimate, pedantic, really technical decisions, or if they were purposely narrowly interpreted just to uphold certain, um, or just to make certain decisions that arguably probably didn't really help consumers all that much. And I'm, I'm not sure the difference between those two, and I'm not sure of that difference in the case. But what I hear you saying is like, that, that that hierarchy that we just laid out, like, okay, you know, credit card companies increase in, uh, interchange fees, merchants pay more or, for those interchange fees, and then that gets passed on to consumers. What I hear you saying here is that um, the court said, well, look, that's, that's not really a violation of antitrust. And did you, Matt, any research, was there anything that said consumers will pay more if interchange fees rise. Was there any evidence that said that? Because I think there are people out there who would argue 
credit card companies can increase interchange fees all they want, and ultimately it won't won't hurt consumers. D- did you find research that would help in one way or the other, or? So within the actual court cases, I didn't find anything like that. Yeah. A lot of the speculation surrounding them by various news outlets did say that that was the case. I believe we might have a caller. Jason's uh, answering the phone right now. But um, I guess one, some things, some little facts I can share with you all. Uh, or do we have a caller? We do. So give me, if Matt, you can finish your point. Oh, I was just going to share some some extraneous information. Please do. Okay. Um, some interesting facts I came across is that um, when we were talking about interchange rates earlier, I mentioned that um, Amex typically charges between three and five percent, and that might not seem like a lot, but actually those uh, those fees add up. Um, in the fourth quarter of 2015, Amex reported $4.9 billion in interchange fee profits compared to just $1.9 billion in interest payment profits for the same period. Now, I, that seems really interesting to me that a credit card company is making more money off these interchange rates than they are the interest of their cards. Right. I feel like that would be the primary, I guess, source of income for a credit card company. And I think... Uh, we were talking in the car earlier, earlier, Jason. You said that that is the case for Visa and MasterCard. Mm-hmm. But because American Express sort of, I guess, markets itself as this more premier card and really um, really promotes its reward system, that this kind of makes sense why this would be their primary source of income. Right. Yeah. To my knowledge, American Express and MasterCard, not American Express, I apologize, Visa and MasterCard primarily get their revenue from interest payments on cards. We'll talk about those at the very end because to me that's the crux of the matter, whereas American Express primarily gets its revenue from these interchange fees because they charge more per transaction. And I believe we do have a caller and you should be on the air right now. Hello? All right, give us a call back, because I am a master. What is the number, Jason? Pressing buttons two one nine eight 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 nine five eight five two one nine eight 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 nine. Matt, you're getting your master's in law. I am going in circuitry. You're or figuring out like Twitter. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's a low blow, man. <laughs> Sorry. That's a low blow. All right, try it again. Are you on the air? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Hello. Excellent. And Thank who, you. Who is uh, this? This is Aaron from Queens. Aaron, Aaron from Queens, you called uh, last show, didn't you? I did. I just wanted and, to call oh, back. Aaron from Queens, I, one second real quick. I I did not yeah. realize uh, who this was last time, but I must say, Aaron from Queens, do I know you? Yeah, I think you do. <laughs> I think you might know me. Aaron from yeah. Queens, I believe that you are uh, my brother, and I really appreciate you listening and giving a call in, and I just, uh, I, I was shocked. Allegedly. That's <laughs> what our parents tell us, but I don't know if we can really trust them fully. So. Well, that, 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 thanks for your call, and Aaron. What what do you got to say about this Ohio versus American Express case? Yeah, so I actually have some expertise on this, and I, uh, I can sort of uh, try to explain. Uh, Matt had some confusion about how this can uh, actually, in the end, benefit consumers, and I think I can explain that. So it, it while it is true everything you guys have been saying uh, about uh, high interchange fees for credit cards when they're uh, up to three, maybe even higher percent than that, while debit cards, they're usually 1% or lower, or a flat, uh, say, 15% fee on all transactions, or not, or 15 cent fee on all transactions, or something like that for debit card. Credit card uh, fees do not all get pocketed by the credit card companies. So if you say Amex takes 3% out of every transaction, if there's a $100 transaction, Amex isn't making $3 in profit from that, not mm. at all. They might just be making uh, $0.20 cents in profit from that $100 transaction because they pass along those interchange fees to uh, the consumers in the form of rewards, credit cards. If This obviously doesn't hold true if somebody is just using, say, a generic Capital One Platinum card that uh, is does not have a reward structure, but I think most credit cards people use in the country are uh, some form or another of a rewards card. And interchange fees make the credit card companies competitive with each other by allowing uh, a certain by allowing these companies to try to outcompete on the reward system. Uh, 
for example, Amex is considered to be the most generous of the uh, reward systems out there. They have the most ways to earn the most amount of points, and I can say that I know that for sure as an avid user and abuser <laughs> of these rewards uh, systems. And basically, it's it's a very it's a very strange way to think about the economy because it's like normally people think about going to a store and buying what you need and the transaction is between you and the store but because money needs to move and we live in you know it's not we we aren't in this techno utopian uh bit bitcoin ethereum type of world yet where you can just you know flash a, a QR code and then the the blockchain does everything automatically for you money still has to move somehow and for people who aren't paying cash that's what uh credit cards are for so yeah that's that's really where the interchange fees come from and i that i i don't i haven't read the justice department's reasoning on this but that would be my reasoning at least uh how uh, high interchange fees can benefit consumers and while it might be true that businesses may might raise their uh Costs, let's say 0.5 percent or one, in order to uh, offset high Amex or Chase or Citibank or whatever interchange fees. Uh, or I, I guess I should say Visa or Mastercard because they're uh, actually doing the processing, but it gets complicated. Um, well, they might uh, raise those if you do if you're maximizing your work properly. You can uh, make a lot more in value than. Uh, you're being charged by the merchants. So, and I've, I've just personally made uh, literally tens of thousands of dollars uh, in both cash and travel uh, rewards just from, you know, I guess, thankfully, high change fees. Well, Aaron, it doesn't, not everybody can take advantage of it, but I'm glad I did. Right. So that you actually just brought up the point I was going to say, Aaron. What, what I hear you saying is that, look, uh, although interchange fees might... Uh, raise the costs for merchants and even consumers, we as consumers benefit because the more credit card companies sort of have to invest into rewards programs, the more we as consumers and users of those credit cards get to benefit from said rewards programs. The only thing I would... Exactly. Uh, I have yeah. a problem with and, that, and though. Actually, that, yeah. The, uh, an, a perfect example of this is that uh, I just read yesterday, J.P. Morgan Chase... Uh, is posted a $330 million loss in their credit card division uh, just from trying to outcompete the other uh, credit card companies in the rewards programs. They're still a massively profitable company with, I think, about $2 billion profit in the last quarter, but they that would have been $330 million higher if not for them trying to outcompete the likes of Amex in rewards. But, yeah, that, that may be true on the company side of things. The problem that I have with this, though, Aaron, is if we're looking at people from consumers, the problem I have with this is that if you don't have a lot of money to begin with, if you are someone who is poor or struggling to make uh, ends meet, you're not benefiting from these reward programs from credit cards because, in my opinion, they're kind of stingy anyways. And also, they only benefit people who actually have the money to use capital and credit. And I just that, that's what I struggle with. So it, it might help those who are middle or upper class, but arguably just raising fees ends up costing the poor even more, and they don't get to take advantage of what you're saying is perhaps a benefit to some consumers. Sure, that's I, and I, I I don't disagree with that at all. That uh, credit cards, uh, well, first of all, if somebody is truly uh, at the, at the very bottom end of the economic spectrum, they probably shouldn't be using credit cards in the first place, and uh, because it's sort of a you can really fall into a terrible trap with credit cards, as you know, if you're not very, very careful about making sure you pay off your statements uh, every month. And probably most people at the bottom end of the economic spectrum are not even using credit cards. They're using prepaid debit cards or cash or writing checks, stuff like that, which will raise a whole other host of very exploitative uh, questions about those practices. And But you could do, I'm sure, an entire episode about, uh, you know, uh, the unbanked of society. All right. uh, but yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to call in, get that in there, and, and explain how uh, it might seem counterintuitive that these these high fees can actually benefit some consumers uh, in the end. But thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate your call. Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye bye. I also, Matt, if I may add just a few things to that. I, I what I hear Aaron saying can extend to taxes, though, right? I mean, 
if we just raise taxes, then we as consumers and citizens benefit from taxation. So I, I just I worry that those who might argue a more conservative or free market position on this would say, well, you know, we consumers end up benefiting in the end because we get better rewards through credit card companies. I mean, why don't they have that same logic then towards taxation? Because well, yeah, I think yeah. it's important where that money ends up. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm glad that Aaron brought up that point because actually something I forgot to mention, but I think is is important to note is that um, in the original court case with the District Court of New York, um, the justice found that. Uh, because Amex actually put forth the same defense that Aaron just described, wherein right. we're charging such high in, uh, interchange fees because we use it to bolster our rewards program. But the district uh, judge found that these perks only partially offset the higher prices. So it's not as if mm. like this was all just going into rewards program that benefited consumers. A lot of it is just profit that Amex makes. And actually, let me just find in my notes right here. Yeah. Um, the judge also found that these provisions, these anti-steering provisions, that is, found it made it possible for Amex to routinely hike merchant fees 20 times in the past five years without losing significant business, and that the provisions effectively blocked entry by other firms. So, I mean, I think uh, no, no um, disrespect towards Aaron towards taking advantage of the system. I mean, we right. all have to survive and and do the do the best that we can. But uh, it really is like. As you said, it is a uh, a wealth transfer from the poor who end up paying these higher prices because interchange fees make merchants raise their own prices, but they don't have access to the reward system that a lot of more wealthy consumers do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would definitely add on to that, Matt, just a few more facts and figures, too, about American credit card debt. So I I think we'll try to wrap up this case here real quick because we only have a few minutes left, and you are listening to Evidence of Design 1. 100.9 100.9 FM WXIR. If you have time, we maybe have a little bit of time. Tweet us evidence design zero or evidence of design 101 at gmail.com. Give us a call. A, a few more facts and figures, Matt, is that I believe American credit card debt is now over $1 trillion. So, mm. an aggregate, all of Americans together, we are in debt in our credit cards alone for $1 tri- trillion. I think like private citizen debt is like 13 trillion or whatever so you know obscenely high i think it was really hard to find definitive facts and figures on this i think from what i i looked up around o- only around 35 percent of americans pay their credit card in full every month meaning 65 percent of americans do not pay their credit cards in full every month and then the average interest rate on credit cards is i believe 15 percent so 65 percent of americans every month are having to pay i believe 15% interest on their credit card balance, if I have all that correct. And that is contributing to personal finance debt and, of course, the, uh, of course, the overall credit card debt. That, to me, is a, is, is a concern. And that I hope I can try to articulate this sort of final wrap-up point, if I can, about, about sort of my concern with all this. Sure. So credit cards, as Aaron said, does have uh, – they do have value. When we yes. use credit cards, we can get points. We can build up, you know, <laughs> I just sound so, I'm sorry. Well, it is yeah. a system that ideally could work. <laughs> right. I think. It could work. And, and the point of credit cards is to give us access to capital, to give us access to credit, to expand our purchasing power. So we can go to the store, we can use a credit card and say, look, you know, I don't have cash for this, but I need this thing to help me grow and do even better. Right? That's the whole point. Like farmers might need to buy machine equipment. Farmers might, might not have $140,000 in cash to buy their tractor, but they can use a credit card. So that's the whole idea of credit and capital. It helps you get better, more successful, even if it puts you in temporary debt. Ideally. Ideally. The problem I have is that in the 1970s, which again is when I think access to credit really exploded, a couple things happened in the 1970s, which is also the birthplace, of course, of instantiated neoliberalism, meaning neoliberalism in sort of public policies, in my opinion, when income and wealth inequality in the United States started to precipitously grow, all sources say started in the 1970s, particularly the late 70s, continued on through Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher in the 80s and till now. So what happened in the 1970s is that American wages, income stopped growing. So we st- our, our wages, our hourly work, which is what, again, most Americans only have, we only have our labor, we only have our bodies to sell. That's the only way that we survive in this world is selling our bodies. That's how the world works in terms of the current instantiation of capitalism. In the 70s, we stopped making more money by selling our bodies in terms of income. Although income has nominally rose, 
uh, the purchasing power, you know, due to inflation and other things, has not risen. So for a while, our incomes have not really grown all that much in terms of purchasing power. What happened in the 1970s, though, though, is a few things happened which made us as Americans feel wealthier. One, we got access to credit cards, meaning, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm not actually having more money, but I'm able to make... (laughs) Well, you're able to make use of more money. I'm able to access more money, money that I don't really have and doesn't doesn't really exist. So that's what happened that made us think that we were wealthier, but it also put us deeper and deeper into debt, into the rabbit hole. Right. Something else that happened in the 1970s is women went to work. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but what happened was that families, more people in the household started to work, including women, which made it so that Americans, in order to support themselves on what previously only a man had to do, typically, because, you know, sexism and all that in society, typically only what a man had to work to support a family, that wasn't sustainable anymore because a number of reasons, such as income not growing, women had to go to work. So you had these sort of dual things going on where we got easier access to credit and more people in the household were going to work, such as women. Hmm. What happened is we started to feel, we had to compensate more in order to feel like we had the same amount of purchasing power. And so my worry in terms of credit cards and, and other things of this nature is that we're not solving the root cause where our labor is not being valued. And so you can have all these things like, you know, reward systems and credit cards and points and just, you know, whatever else. But the point is, in America, labor is getting destroyed over and over again in terms of, for example, recent cases in Janus versus AFSCME and Lewis versus Epic Systems Corporations. And this one is an argument a stretch to make. I will consent to that. Ohio versus American Express. It's hard to say that how this really affects labor. But I argue that just the general theory is that labor is being hurt over and over again in favor of these alternative economic practices that end up not actually fixing the root causes of capitalism, which produces poverty. And so that I hope was able to sum up kind of my thinking on this. Uh, there's a lot more to it, but I, I, you know, I I don't know, Matt, if you have a few moments to reflect on that, does that kind of make sense or do you disagree or, um, I guess just one of my concerns is that with the Supreme court ruling, uh, supporting MX's anti-steering provisions where I mean, imagine that, all the credit card companies are now are going to be uh, using these. And the credit card market, as you stated earlier, is an oligopoly. It's controlled mm-hmm. by four major companies, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. Mm-hmm. And um, I just personally, I, I, I'm uneasy about how, how surreptitious and sort of duplicitous interchange fees feel to me because they're invisible to consumers. Mm-hmm. Their dis- uh, merchants are now legally discouraged to talk about them. And it's it's just all shady and secretive to me, and I I feel like people have a right to know and, and should be concerned with where their money is going, what what happens to it, what happens when you when you pay with a credit or debit card versus when you mm-hmm. pay with cash. Absolutely. So I guess the takeaway for listeners is next time you go to a store, uh, pay cash. <laughs> Matt, no steering, no I'm steering fine. provisions. <laughs> we have not signed an agreement with any company, but, um, uh, you know, ask, ask the customer or ask the, sorry, the vendor, ask the person behind the cashier and just out of curiosity, like, Hey, have you heard of interchange fees? And that's not trying to trap them into anything. I'm just curious to raise awareness about these. Yeah. Things. We, like, like you said, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what this means for everything, but I think it's what's most important to take from all this is that we should be more aware about interchange fees. We should know what they are and what they do, and we should be talking about them. Absolutely. Let's talk about them, and that's the whole point. And I, I appreciate Aaron for giving a call today. And, of course, folks, we'd love to have you participate on the show. Send me an email. Send us an email, evidence design, sorry, evidenceofdesign101 at gmail.com, or tweet us, evidence design zero, And let us know some future things you'd like to have in the show, some future topics. And if you'd like to contribute any questions or comments, we'd love to have you on air. You can find our past episodes on air as well at Evidence of Design. That's our YouTube channel. Be specific with your search, Evidence of Design Episode X, and it will come up for you. Thanks a lot for listening, though, folks. We had a lot of fun, and we appreciate being able to spend this time with you and on WXIR. My name is Jason Taylor, your host, and I was also joined by my good friend who did great research today. Thanks. Matt Treadwell. Be well, be safe. We'll see you next week, 